This is the third and last video on introducing entropy and looking at what we can do with this new idea of entropy. Now, the truth is, in this lower division physics class, we spend most of our time analyzing reversible processes. So this is a fair question to ask. What happens when these processes are irreversible? In the last example we looked at, we looked at uh, free expansion, uh, which is an example of a non-quasi-static process. Non-quasi-static irreversible processes have limited utility in this class because for us to be able to analyze something, we kind of have to be able to represent it on a PV diagram. And if it's represented on a PV diagram, then they have to be quasi-static. That's the only way we can represent them with a path on a PV diagram. So what I want to do in this video is analyze an example of irreversible process, irreversible cycle, that are quasi-static, so we can represent them on PV diagram, and we can analyze in detail what happens. Now, since it's a concrete example, let me use the Carnot cycle as this concrete example. We'll be looking at a Carnot engine operating between a high temperature reservoir and a low temperature reservoir. So you have seen this many times before. Let's see, starting from this point on the cycle, it undergoes isothermal expansion, transferring heat. And to move to the lower isotherm, it undergoes adiabatic expansion. And then once it's at the temperature of the low temperature reservoir, then it undergoes isothermal contraction, transferring heat. And the cycle concludes with adiabatic compression, which will bring the engine back up to the temperature of the high temperature reservoir. Now, what I've drawn here is a reversible Carnot engine cycle. Since we want to make this cycle irreversible, we should look at sources of irreversibility. We talked about two sources. One is friction. It has the benefit of being familiar to you. You have seen it in physics 4A. You have seen it how it irreversibly converts mechanical energy into thermal energy. But the problem for, well, me is friction tends to be messy. So I would uh, rather not deal with the friction if I didn't have to. So let me look at the other source of irreversibility, the second one, which is heat transfer. Now, not all heat transfer is irreversible. These heat transfers, they are reversible. That's why it's a reversible Carnot engine. What makes a heat transfer irreversible is when they happen through a finite temperature difference. Heat flows from hot to cold and never cold to hot. If you are very patient, heat can transfer between two objects that are at the same temperature. That's the reversible heat flow. So let's imagine what would happen to the Carnot engine, keeping everything the same with just one this uh, small change, that the heat transfer that will now occur will be an irreversible heat transfer with the goal of making Carnot engine practical. Okay, let me start somewhere in the middle so I don't mess up the vertexes. <laughs> so starting somewhere in the middle of the adiabatic compression, I'm gonna continue to adiabatically compress, but stop a little bit short of when the Carnot engine reaches the temperature of the hot temperature reservoir. This allows the isothermal expansion to occur with a little bit of temperature difference. And this temperature difference will help heat transfer occur a little bit more quickly. And it's also going to make the heat transfer irreversible. And then the Carnot engine will undergo adiabatic expansion as before, and we stop it a little bit before it reaches the low temperature reservoir. And then it's going to be compressed isothermally 
and this temperature difference as before will help drive the heat transfer and also it'll make the heat transfer irreversible and once it's at the correct point then we start compressing it adiabatically to complete the cycle and return to the same point it started from so this is the irreversible Carnot cycle it's uh, remarkably similar to the reversible Carnot cycle in fact if I didn't draw the isotherms of the high and low temperature reservoir, if I just drew the Carnot cycle alone, you wouldn't be able to tell if uh, it's irreversible or reversible. So with that, let's imagine calculating change of entropy over one cycle. Because we are dealing with a quasi-static process, the infinitesimal change of entropy over any process is equal to infinitesimal transfer of heat divided by temperature of the system as the heat is transferring. We are going to have to perform this integral along these lines. So it's going to be a line integral and there's a notation that we like to use whenever a line integral or some kind of integral over geometry returns to the same point or it's closed in some sense. We use this integral symbol with a closed circle to indicate that it's a integral over a cycle. Uh, and actually you will see this notation again when we start doing electromagnetism. The reason I picked a Carnot cycle for this example is that this integral is particularly simple for a Carnot cycle because heat transfer only occurs along the isotherms. I can just uh, rewrite this integral like an algebraic expression. All of this is equal to this integral that we are trying to evaluate. What would you guess this is equal to? If you said zero, then you have a good understanding of what it means for something to be a state function. After one whole cycle, the engine comes back to the same state it started out from. So when we compute this change in the entropy, it has to add up to zero. But that is so, what's the right word here? Frustrating. <laughs> We want entropy to have some meaningful difference when a cyclical process is reversible versus when it is irreversible. And what this uh, quick example is showing is as long as we are looking at entropy change of the system, that that's always going to be zero for a cyclical process. Again, that is what it means for entropy to be a state function. If it didn't behave that way, it's not a state function. So where do we look for a difference between the irreversible and reversible cycles? You look for it in all the other places that's not the system. You look for the change in entropy in the environment. So let me slightly modify this expression here so that we can talk about the thermal reservoirs and still use some of the information from the Carnot engine cycle to be able to calculate the entropy change of the environment. Now the challenge here is that we have PV diagram of the Carnot engine. We don't have the PV diagram of the thermal reservoirs. When we are looking for the entropy change of the reservoir, we are looking for net heat transfer into the reservoir and the temperature of the reservoir. Now here's the useful thing to realize. This uh, heat transfer here, which we described as heat transfer into the engine, it's also heat transfer out of the high temperature reservoir because of conservation of energy. And the same thing here. QL is the heat transfer into the low temperature reservoir, which means we have a way to connect this DQ reservoir with something we've been talking about, 
this can simply be the DQ that we were talking about all along, that heat transfer into the heat engine, except with a little minus sign, because whatever heat comes into the engine is coming out of the reservoir. And I think uh, at this point, this is the question that we should be interested in. When we compute this quantity, is that going to be equal to zero? Or is that going to be not equal to zero? And I guess there are really two ways for it to be not equal to zero. It could be greater than zero, or it could be less than zero. And we have all the tools we need to answer that question. Let me clean up a little bit around my PV diagram. So when we calculate this integral, it still comes down to two pieces. It's going to have heat minus QH flowing out of the high temperature reservoir at temperature TH, and there's going to be heat flowing into the low temperature reservoir, QL. And we knew how these terms add up for a hypothetical process. The reversible Carnot cycle that did isothermal expansion along the isotherm that overlaps with the thermal reservoir and did isothermal compression along the isotherm that overlapped with low temperature reservoir. And what that recognition does is it helps us figure out how QH has changed from the value that would have made this combination add up to zero. That's what it was before with the reversible process. Now, with the irreversible process, you can see here, comparing the area under the curve of the reversible isothermal expansion, this is the whole area, and the area under the curve of the irreversible isothermal expansion, the area has decreased, which means the work done with the irreversible isothermal expansion is less than the reversible one. And now, through the first law of thermodynamics, we know that for isothermal process, change in internal energy is zero. So whatever change there is for the work directly goes to change in the heat transfer. All of this to say, this QH, in the case of irreversible Carnot cycle, is less than before. Now let's look at QL. So in the case of QL, we are comparing this area here in the case of reversible Carnot engine with this area here in the current case of irreversible Carnot engine. So following the same reasoning as before, looking at the amount, just the magnitude of work done and connecting it through the first law, we can draw this conclusion that QL is greater than before. So this is what you get when you look at this comparison of this irreversible process with the previously reversible process. The negative quantities has a smaller magnitude than before, and the positive quantities has larger magnitude than before. So these terms that previously added up to zero will now add up to a number greater than zero. And this is more or less what we are looking for, a statement somewhere that change of entropy is greater than zero in an irreversible process. Now what you have to be careful here is that it was not the change in entropy of the engine because the engine moves in a cycle. It's the change of entropy of the environment or the reservoir. That's where you will find your increase in the entropy. Now, this result has a particular way of presentation, uh, which you won't see in our textbook, but you know, these four weeks of thermodynamics, I've covered plenty of things that you don't see in our textbook. So let me do a little bit of rewriting here so that I can present it in a form that seen elsewhere, not in our textbook, but seen elsewhere. So writing this without this minus sign, I can write this. The integral over a cycle 
of TQ divided by temperature of the reservoir. I got rid of that minus sign. So this inequality here now flips the direction. So it's less than zero in the case of irreversible heat engine. And if you're dealing with reversible heat engine, then the equality will hold. So this statement here is called the Clausius inequality. And this gives us a third statement of the second law of thermodynamics, that entropy. Now, in this case, we are looking at the environment. Let's make it simple and say entropy of everything, heat engine and the environment. Entropy of everything always increases or stays the same. Or the change in entropy of everything is always greater than or equal to zero for all processes. And in the case of Clausius inequality, you should connect this term here with the minus of the change of entropy of the reservoir. So this concludes our introduction of entropy. And we got a new statement of second law of thermodynamics out of it. I don't know if that's a good thing, but that's what we got. And uh, I will wrap up this introduction here. I have just one more lecture video giving you one more description of entropy and a statement of second law that's actually my favorite formulation of second law because I think it's the most fundamental way to state the second law of thermodynamics. So watch out for that and I will wrap up our long introduction into entropy here. Bye.